Our gospel lesson is found in the gospel according to Mark, uh, chapter number 11 and beginning with verse number 1. When they were approaching Jerusalem, Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Pray with me, please. God, we are grateful for this story of our faith. It was once spoken and then written and then passed down to us. And so we pray that it might speak to us anew on this day and that your spirit might bring it to life for us. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto you. Amen. As is often the case, our liturgical season, which includes Lent, Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter, intersects with another season, which is also followed with religious zeal. You know where I'm going. The men's and women's basketball tournament is in full swing. <laughs> and just as there are certain terms and phrases which we associate with our liturgical season, there are terms and phrases which have become a part of our conversations in this particular part of the basketball season. When else do we speak of things without batting an eye and with full understanding of their meaning, things like March Madness and Sweet Sixteens and Elite Eights and Final Fours, Bracket Busters, Upset Alerts, and Cinderella Stories? Well, I will not lecture you on the need to keep the results of March Madness in perspective regarding who wins and who loses. And yes, Chris, I'm looking right at you. <laughs> I mean, after all, it's not football season, for heaven's sake. <laughs> In fact, rather than pit these seasons against each other, I want to build a bridge. Uh, we, we liberals are sometimes commended and sometimes accused of trying to f find some way of finding everybody and everything to get along. So I'll throw out this term, sleeper, as a way to bridge the two worlds. In sports jargon, a sleeper is a team which most people aren't paying much attention to. No one is expecting them to go very far in the tournament. But some expert on some network will tab them a sleeper because of some intangible, some momentum they picked up at the end of the season, or some factor that they believe you need to watch this team. Don't sleep on this team. In my world, the world of the preacher, a sleeper takes on a bit different meaning. <laughs> it involves the anxiety that we feel when we are 
trying to bring to life these old stories and to keep everybody awake as we do it. Stories which we've heard literally maybe hundreds, thousands of times perhaps, like this one of Palm Sunday. Now I'll go ahead and let the cat out of the bag so that we don't have to worry about it one iota. I don't have anything new to say about this story that you've heard a thousand times. I don't even have anything new to say that I've maybe said a thousand times. But none of that diminishes, not even in the slightest, the importance and the mystery of this day, which our other worship leaders and helpers have helped to frame so wonderfully for us. What we know in our minds about familiar stories is far less important than how we engage these stories with our hearts and with our imaginations. So this is the invitation that I offer to you as we begin. Join me in reimagining this story in the manner in which it makes its way to us. I want to ask some what-if questions. But first, scholars do believe that on the same day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem from the east on a donkey, that marching in from the west would have been the Roman army. They would have been needed there to keep the crowd under control that had gathered there for Passover. Control. It was one of the linchpins of Roman oppression. Their entrance would have been far different from Jesus' entrance. Their entrance would have been a show of strength, a show of force. They would have been riding on chariots and their leaders on great, great white stallions. The unwritten signs would say very clearly, don't mess with the Romans or else. When Jesus rode into town on a donkey, oh, what a scene that must have been. His feet almost dragging on the ground in an absurd visual picture. He was making a very clear and unapologetic statement. To understand the events of this day, we must understand this. Jesus was humble, but he was not shying away from the conflict. Jesus' entrance on a donkey was a parody of the way of the Romans. It was a parody of the way of the world of power. Jesus was making a mockery of that way. And anybody watching would know it. Jesus was announcing another way. It was a way of peace. It was a way of self-sacrifice. It was a way of compassion. It was a way of truth. It was a way which embodied the prophetic injunction to know that the requirements of the Lord are not hidden or even complicated, but are to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk in humility. When those who are speaking and calling and working for peace enter into a world dominated by power and force, announcing that that world is passing and will one, way, one day give way to God's way, a confrontation ensues in which power will flex its muscles. And since, we, and since we know the rest of the story of this Holy Week, we know that, in fact, they did. And so, I offer you the first exercise in some what-ifs of Palm Sunday. What if the way of humility illustrated here by Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey, humility, challenging the powers that be? What if that way became the dominant form of Christianity in America? 
Now let's be clear, confessional and honest. It is not the dominant form of Christianity in our world. And it can only continue this way of Jesus to have breath and life. If there are communities of faith courageous enough to take the risk of living in a way which is counter to a culture of power. And it takes courage. What if Jesus' way had survived the persecution of the early church? What if it had survived the early stages of its life when it spoke truth to power? And what if it had survived the stage in which it became the state religion and stopped speaking truth to power? So much. What if it had survived the holy wars? What if it had survived the panic of those frightened by scientific enlightenment who tried to turn Christianity into an acceptance of dry doctrinal, doctrinal creeds? And who then promoted a literal understanding of the Bible which turned our holy, life giving scriptures into a golden calf to be idolized? instead of a living document meant to spur our spiritual imaginations to another way, to higher ground. What if Jesus' way had survived the politicians who used Jesus as a prop to attain and then protect their power? What if the way of Jesus had survived the divisions within the church? What if the way of Jesus had survived the greed of the world? What if there wasn't agreement about everything within Christ's church, but there was a unity around the conviction that to be a part of it means to be ardent doers of justice, passionate lovers of kindness, and to walk in a journey in humility. What if this way of Jesus who entered Jerusalem on a donkey had taken such deep root in the Christian community that the Christian community could never sit in silence or complicity when pirates of the faith attempt to turn it into a weapon of hatred against the LGBTQ community? Or a tool of misogynistic oppression meant to keep women in a subjugated place? What if the way of Jesus, this donkey-riding Messiah, had survived with such force that the poor were as important to the church as they were to Jesus and the Hebrew prophets? What if the way of Jesus turned his followers into peacemakers who would never sit idly by as religiously sanctioned walls were built which defined some people in and some people as out? What if what if the way of Jesus was allowed to so fully run its course that greatness in our world was redefined by the Messiah who washed his disciples' feet with a towel? And most importantly of all the what ifs, what if there is still time? As the saying goes, what if there is still enough time, but none to spare, to build a church which isn't so much a sterile and dying institution as much as it is a home and a haven for followers of the way of Jesus? What if? Let's take a brief respite from the what ifs with the promise that we'll come back. Through the years, and I, this comes to my mind, I think nearly every Palm Sunday, I think of Thomas, who became my favorite disciple of Jesus. There is a story which is only told in John's Gospel, which immediately follows this entrance into Jerusalem. In it, Jesus announces to his disciples, who are out in the country, that they are going toward Jerusalem. And everybody knows what is waiting for Jesus and for those associated with him in Jerusalem. There are people with bad intentions just waiting for Jesus to show his face. And Jesus says to his followers, 
That's where we're going. Well, some of the details are left to the imagination, but it isn't hard to imagine the disciples sort of shifting their feet a little bit, heads down, anxious glances at one another. There was danger waiting for Jesus, and his friends would get caught up in it as well. And finally, after all of that hemming and hawing and Shuffling of feet, Thomas speaks up, and he is the only one to speak. And remember that Thomas' name became synonymous with doubt. Remember who we came to know Thomas to be. If he, he was a pessimist, a curmudgeon. If he looked up at a partly cloudy sky, he was waiting on the bottom to fall out. If the rest of the disciples saw a glass that was half full, Thomas noticed that it's half empty. He was under no illusions that it wouldn't be as bad as they thought in Jerusalem. Thomas, in keeping with his character, probably believed it was going to be much worse than they thought. And then he cleared his throat. And perhaps his voice trembled. And he looked at the other followers of Jesus and he said, let us go. Let us go to Jerusalem that we might die with him. Sometimes I think I would love to have a friend like that. And sometimes I think, God willing, I would like to be a friend like that. Thomas said, let's go with our friend into that mess. But what if What if this element of the story received us the same weight as the failures of the disciples later in Holy Week? And what if we came to know that even though we aren't perfect, we're never going to be, and it's a waste of energy to try, that nevertheless loyalty and friendship to one another can be the hallmark of faith communities? We aren't. We aren't are not fated to be betrayers and deniers of love, of its power, or its place, or to be deniers and betrayers of one another. We are not fated. What if the church could elevate an an alternative witness to the world, an alternative witness to pettiness and backbiting and division? What if the followers of the way could be recognized by their loyalty and love to one another and by the manner in which they employ all the powers of forgiveness and community and grace and courage to create spaces which are safe, Everyone who enters them. What if? And what if across the land, faith communities, big and small, and, and in between, endeavored to make love and loyalty their enduring legacy? And what if it is true? What if it is true that if you build it, the seekers of hope will come? Well, I know and you know where the story of Holy Week leads. I know that on Good Friday, Hosanna is turned to calls for crucifixion. The people and the government and the powers that be demanded the blood of Jesus. And yet still on this Sunday, we are meant to ask, what if? As we wait for Easter... What if God does a new thing, and what if we are asked to be a part of it? I want to close with a story that I've shared before. It feels right. It is an imaginary story, and it calls us to employ our imaginations and to ask, what if? The story is told in a number of versions, but I will use the one shared by Otis Moss III, pastor of Trinity UCC in Chicago. It isn't literally true, but it carries profound truth. It was early in the 1800s on an island off the coast of South Carolina. 
The sun was beating down on those with dark skin, those carrying the weight of slavery in their bodies. The slave driver was keeping careful watch to make sure nobody took a moment to rest from their labors. One of them, a woman, was picking cotton while also tending to her six-year-old child. And on this day, in the heat and the humidity and the weight of slavery in her body, it became too much, and she collapsed. Her frail body could stand no more, and she lay motionless on the ground. The boy, her son, tried to revive her because he knew what no six-year-old should ever have to know. That if the slave driver found her this way, they would whip her and demand that she just get back to work. He saw those slave drivers coming towards them, but before they arrived, an old man sort of shuffled up to their side. The people called him preacher or prophet. The slave drivers called him old devil. So you know already we're going to like him. The boy looked into the old man's face and said, is it time? The old man whispered one word into his ear and the ear of his mother, Kulaba. It's an African word which, mean, which means God is in you. The woman began to sit up. Her spirit renewed and revived by that word, her strength returning. The other workers in the field stopped to watch what was going on, and as they did, she began to elevate off the ground. She grabbed the hand of her son, and he began to rise toward heaven with her. What was happening? They were flying away from all of that. The slave drivers on their horses watched with disbelief. Then with anger, they raced toward the preacher with their whips swirling in the air. The preacher looked at the other workers and shouted, It's time. It is time. Kulaba, Kulaba, Kulaba. God is in you. God is in you. God is in you. Here's how Otis Moss described the scene in his magnificent telling of the story. The Africans rose from the fields, and their flight to freedom began. Can you imagine this sight? What if, what if, the dehumanized flying, the disenfranchised flying, the dishonored flying, the discouraged flying, the downtrodden flying, the dismissed flying, the dismembered flying, the disadvantaged flying, the diseased flying, the disinherited and the dislocated flying to another world of freedom. All taking flight with such grace and beauty to a new world. What if? It is Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday in some respects reminds us of all that is broken in the world, but because it is Palm Sunday, it leaves us hoping for Easter, and it is meant this day these palms, that beautiful music that we heard, my words, the written and holy word of the sacred text of our scriptures are meant to leave us asking on this day, what if? What if despite all of the cynicism and the skepticism and the hopelessness living unchecked in the hearts of women and men, what if? What if God will do a new thing. And what if we're asked to be a part of it? It's time to go into Holy Week and to wait. And I will just leave you with that. What if? Amen.